During the pandemic, we lost the ability to teach in classrooms, in person, with materials. But what we didn't lose was our connection and our community. And in fact, what we did gain was a deeper realization that at the very heart of preschool, when everything else has been taken away, is wonder. Join us today as Sally Hoy shares with us the wonder of play-based learning. Welcome back to the Preschool All-Stars Podcast. I'm your host, Joy Anderson, and I'm here with my good friend, Sally Hoy. She is the CEO and founder of Fairy Dust Teaching. Fairy Dust Teaching is built on the passion for the wonder and magic in early childhood. They believe young children have the right to play, to be collaborators in their learning, and to dream. She is also the author of the book, The Wonder Art Workshop. Sally, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. I am so excited to be here. Thank you. So I met you last summer when out of nowhere came this ray of light, this beacon of energy in the midst of the global pandemic, COVID, the preschool world being turned upside down, daycare centers, preschool classes, everywhere shutting down, came a beautiful summit called the Play First Summit. Came out of nowhere. You gathered together all these preschool leaders and gathered together, quite frankly, the entire preschool community of teachers and everyone in the field to reimagine what preschool looks like, to reimagine what early childhood education looks like in a now changing world. Where did the idea for the summit come from? Well, thank you so much for bringing that. One of the things that I've done in Fairy Dust is every summer and actually many winters, I put on a conference, right? And so it's just the rhythm of what me and my, my staff do. Well, here comes the pandemic. We're gearing up for the summer conference. And I'm like, there is no way, no way I can charge people for this. Yeah, it is the budget for our year. So I'm like, what are we going to do? And um, decided that we would do the summit model and uh, offer it for free for people to attend during the time it was live and then offer it lifetime access for those who wanted it. So as I was contemplating this and, and speculating and getting excited, like, you know, this would be amazing. I thought, of course, Teacher Tom, who is, you know, someone I highly regard and respect and his enthusiasm and really clarity of voice and play. So it was just a really dynamic pairing to put together this beautiful and really needed for my soul. <laughs> like, you know, it was just, I was at the time in lockdown, trapped in Morocco. And so I couldn't even get home, you know? So I was like, in, you know, I think the, the feeling of needing to create something magnificent was big. I was even cleaning my clothes in a bucket. Like it was eating off a Bunsen burner, you know, like life was really feeling um, dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, so, you know, I think in those moments, you want to give back, you want to give to your community. Yeah. So, and boy, I was, I'm still just amazed at the response, you know, 70 some thousand people took part. It's a lot. Yeah. That is a ton. I mean, I, I have to say that's probably the most people, if I know my numbers correctly, it's probably the biggest summit in the preschool space yeah. ever. Would that be accurate? Yeah. I would say it, it wouldn't be uh, the biggest. I would say, you know, Barb O'Neill does a transforming, challenging behavior. Brilliant. You know, highly recommend that one as well. And I think she's hit the 70,000s in attendance as well in the preschool, you know, domain. But probably in the play space, we, we got it. A hundred percent. Now, you yeah. talked about being in Morocco during the pandemic, and earlier we had talked about you traveling the world, and you've been in yeah. Paris for the last 18 months. Truly, having seen the world as you've seen, I mean, mm. most of us don't. We live in, you know, one state our whole life, or at least stateside our whole life, or different different countries our whole life. Having seen the entire world, though, you must have had an understanding of of what everyone must be going through and knowing this can pull us together. Yeah, you know, and I think the interesting thing is, you know, and being in a country like 
one thing that's really dramatic to me, even being in France, which is, you know, an amazing country with amazing gifts, is my access to materials that I'm used to having in the U.S. is minuscule. You know, like I was preparing photos and whatnot for my book, trying to get supplies, and I couldn't get them, you know, so I had to work through the States. So, you know, just realizing like going to the Philippines, Vietnam, all these different places that really the pandemic brought me to my knees. What matters most is relationship. It brought it right back to what matters most in our educational methodologies is relationship. You know, it's like, okay, we have to go virtual. You know, we're losing the classroom or play base. Like this is insanity. But you cannot take away what matters most, my relationship with that child, my support of that child. So I think really, for me, the pandemic has brought forth the gold in life. You know, what really counts, you know, like you can take everything away from me, but you cannot take away my heart. Can't. I love that. And yeah. the relationships we have between our peers, other leaders, oh. other educators, but stemming, of course, from the love of our teaching children. So yeah. your philosophy is this amazing, you know, worldwide philosophy of like, I just, I, to be in your shoes, to have traveled and learned the things that you've been able to experience, would you say that it also stems from the Reggio approach? I, you know, I, I would say that I am an influenced deeply and inspired deeply by many giants in the field, Reggio Emilia, Waldorf Education, you know, Paget, <laughs> Velasky, you know, like uh, Jerome Bruner, you know, like there's all of these greats that have influenced me and moved me in my work. And I think when you boil it all down, you know, this is again, the pandemic really helped me get to the heart of the matter is that it's play that children are wired to play. And it's interesting if you watch children in play from birth moving through early childhood, that this interest driven play develops them into full human beings. So like we get all concerned with all these programs and curriculums when actually play is the most powerful curriculum on the planet. You know, it's like, yeah, it's amazing. In fact, I was walking recently and walked by a a whole play yard of children. And, and of course, speaking a language, I don't speak French well. And I was like, that laughter, the play, it could be in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It's universal. It's global. So really, fairy dust, my mission is to bring the gold standard globally as play-based education for early childhood. It's what everything I do is built for that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Regardless of the language, regardless of the materials available, regardless of the platform locally or online, children are children. They're hardwired to play and to learn. I think that we've had the discussion in, in the space where, you know, will children be set back? And this is the big conversation of, <laughs> oh no, they're going to, you know, regress and they won't be able to catch up. And we have to go back to saying, we have a lot of years ahead of us. <laughs> and as long right. as we keep the foundation, like you talked about, keeping that what's most important matters, the other stuff works itself out. Exactly. And I think this whole notion of catching up, catching up to what? Who's standard? Who says there's something to catch up to? You know, for a three-year-old, a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, I mean, seriously, catch up? I, it's ludicrous. It's absolutely ludicrous. In fact, you know, any understanding of how learning gets sticky, then you know emotional well-being is the most important thing. We're in a pandemic. We're in a collective trauma. Hey, we probably need downtime. <laughs> we probably need children, no matter what, what your approach is, children need space. You know, the, it just drives me crazy when I hear the, you know, what if they fall behind? You know, yay, let them fall behind. <laughs> <laughs> and then let them renew the yes. things they need to renew. Absolutely. And I think it goes back to trusting children. I think this is one of the things that is at a crisis point for 
you know, work with young children is to trust young children, to trust their play, to trust that, you know, what interests them is serving. I always see that interest drives play, which drives development and to trust that cycle that is absolutely serving the child. It serves the child when they're learning to crawl, then to walk, then to potty train, to, you know, it all unfolds perfectly. And why we think it doesn't matter or make sense at four or five or six is mind boggling, right? Like we feel like they're going to be illiterate if we don't, <laughs> you know, here's your A, here's your B. You know, it's like, no. Yeah. I think once you understand the power of play and its impact on children's development as whole human beings, I think this is the other really important part, you know, the heart, their mind, their emotions, all of it, right? It's physically, um, yeah, play serves them. It is the highest level education you can give them. Has the highest a bad level rap. of education. That is beautiful. That's it's beautiful. the most academic. In my opinion, you really understand the brain science of play. It is the most academic approach you can have because you're developing thinkers. And one of the things that I think teachers struggle with, some teachers, because they're not driving it. Like they they feel like, well, but I'm not directing it rather, right? Like, so if if they think, well, how can I get this child to learn X, Y, Z? I must be the person to teach them. And mm-hmm. yet as teachers, what is our role? Perhaps it's facilitators, right? Right. And I think this goes back to, which, you know, tipping the hat to Reggio Emilia, it's Teaching begins with your image of the child. What do you view the child as needing? What is driving your perception? So when I see an educator who's attached to worksheets, I know that choice is being made out of their view of what the child needs. My view is that the child's completely capable, competent, and should be allowed to take some risks, should be allowed to, you know, push the boundaries a little with you know, maybe fort building or climbing or whatever that is, um, because I believe in their, their, their capacity, right? And I'm going to be there if they, you know, need support. But I think we really hold children too small. We invalidate what's possible. Um, I love the whole idea that uh, Malaguchi said that children are rich with potential. They're rich with potential. I love that. It reminds me of uh, this YouTube video I saw one time of this amazing play space for children um, where they went to school. It was all outdoors, but there were there was it was forts and climbing structures and everything was completely what Americans would probably call incredibly dangerous um, (laughs) contraptions. I mean, we take away swings just from schoolyards just because, oh no, someone might get hit in front of the swing. Um, But allowing, allowing them to set those, you know, to try out their own boundaries and dare and risk and have the consequences of how else do we learn? Right. Right. And then also on the, you know, in, in addition to is the capacity to, to contemplate, to build their own theories, their own ideas about things, you know, to speculate, you know, I want to have my own fort. How can I build that? What do I need? How, what does it work if I put this together? What's the outcome of that? You know, who else do I want? You know, play is a social interaction, you know, that collaboration that arises. And, you know, as an educator, I loved it when there were breakdowns, when that social upheaval happened. Because it was a brilliant moment, right, to really facilitate how we resolve conflict. You know, how else do they they learn if we keep solving it for them? 100%. That's right. Yeah, they have to learn. They have to know how to solve their own problems. Because guess what? In life, we do not have the teacher next to us telling us, use your words, you know, (laughs) ask them this. (laughs) And what I find so interesting with young children is just the ability to say what's so for them to another. And, you know, in my 20 plus years of teaching, I rarely saw children need to have steps after the conflict. They just needed to express what was so and be heard by the other. Like, you know, that power of being witnessed 
is huge for young children. And I think that's what we forget when we witness and we give space, give room for them to articulate their ideas, their wants, their theories about what would be engaging to partake in at this moment. What a gift to give to another human being. Imagine yourself at four years old uh, being in an environment that said your ideas, what you want to do are really brilliant and we're a hundred percent behind you. In fact, you know, wow, let's do it. I mean, validation hello, <laughs> instead of, you know, we've come from this. I know I came from an environment of be seen, not heard, stay out of the way, follow the rules, be quiet. Don't cause trouble. <laughs> Don't talk back, you know, talking back. It, it could be sharing an idea, but it was cloaked as talking back. No, I actually have a, a, an opinion here. And that's, again, where Reggie Amelia brought this magnificent, like I, I'm still not over it. It gives me goosebumps that children are full citizens, full human beings in this moment, right now, at two, at three, at four, who have the right to be heard. It's massive. That. Yeah, just imagine a globe of young children growing up in that. How the world would change. Massively, massively. Yeah. Love that. So your summit came out last summer and you mentioned that every year you do something like this. Are you planning on doing another one? Because I tell you, it is so needed in the world. Yes, we will absolutely be doing another one. We're still in production looking at, you know, the theme and, and, you know, what we're going to focus on at this point. But I can give you a link for people if they want to go and get on the waiting list to get notified once we release the details. Absolutely. So, yeah. Where can our listeners go to get on that summit wait list for sure? So it will be at fairydustteaching.com slash wait list. So. That's perfect. Go to fairydustteaching.com slash waitlist to be able to get on Sally's next summit so that we can bring together the world of educators yeah. and not feel alone anymore. Sally, thank you so much for being on our podcast. Thank you. I enjoyed it so much. If you love today's episode, then you are going to love this. I want to give you a free gift in your hands. This is a copy of my book, Start Your Preschool, and I want to get it to you for free. Yes, I said for free. It is a 300-page book. It'll help you learn the step-by-step -step process to actually starting your local or your online preschool. Every single step that I walked myself through, as well as the thousands of women who's created their own successful preschools have gone through the exact steps listed in this book. Not to mention, I also share 20 amazing women's stories. So as you can see how not only did it work for me, but it works for amazing women just like you as well. I want to get you this free copy. Just go to freepreschoolbook.com or click the link in the description and we'll get it to you today. Again, just go to freepreschoolbook.com and we'll get it right to you. 